But thank you, of course, to, to Carlo Rovelli. Let me, let me kick off. Um, my name is Rohan Silver. I'm founder of Second Home, and we're a cultural venue and, uh, and, and, a, and an incubator of creative and diverse businesses and charities. And the whole idea behind Second Home is this belief we have that the cross-pollination between different fields, what happens when different types of ideas and disciplines and industries and people come together, you know, what happens is, is always good. <laughs> that's where new ideas and innovations come from. And so that's what we're about. It's why we have a, a beautiful bookshop called Liberia, where you can find uh, Helgoland. Uh, and uh, it's also why we have spaces in London, Lisbon and Los Angeles, where I am right now. Um, and there's really no one better, I think, that exemplifies this way of interdisciplinary thinking than, than Carlo Rovelli. So it's such an honor to have him here with us. Um, he needs very little introduction from me, of course. You know, you're all, you've all joining us because you know about Carlo. Um, but, you know, as it says on his, uh, on the blurb of his, of his brilliant new book, Helgoland, Carlo Rovelli is a theoretical physicist who has made significant contributions to the physics of space and time. Um, he's currently directing the Quantum Gravity Research Group uh, of the Centre de Physique Theorique in Marseille, France. And uh, he's the author of, uh, of, of three previous books, all of which I think we've, we've uh, been lucky enough to talk about here at Second Home. The Seven Basic Lessons on Physics, The Order of Time and Reality is Not What It Seems. And his latest book, uh, really focusing in on, on quantum physics and quantum phenomena uh it's called helgoland and uh i we're going to be we're going to be diving into that and, and so much else so carlo thank you so much for for joining us um i want to start with the title helgoland um uh, would you tell people listening you know where the hell helgoland is and why it's so you know fundamentally significant for um you know this understanding of of, of reality, which uh, you're keen for us to, to explore. Thank you, Rohan. Thank you very much for this uh, uh, for this opportunity. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure being at Second Home and uh, being being back with you guys because uh, it's a place where um, you know uh, we can talk more more in depth about about things. I've been in 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 interviews with journalists. It's always you know on the surface just a few, and 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 I really look forward for this. Uh, uh, this exchange for trying to um, uh, to talk more uh, uh, more clearly, also more more in depth about things. Helgoland, it's an island. It's a a, a small little island between uh, Germany, Denmark, and the UK, so the Northern Sea, uh, where a uh, hundred years ago, so nineteen twenty five, uh, a young guy who is uh, Werner Heisenberg. Uh, uh, 23 years old, so spectacularly young, had the key idea of quantum mechanics. The idea that it just re really turned, the, turned the, the, the situation from a completely confused mess of little, um, little pieces of evidence about strange new physics in the atomic world into an actual theory uh, with new ideas and new mathematics. He was there alone. Uh, in a sort of feverish uh, 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 focus on, on, on calculating and, and thinking. Um, he was full of philosophy, poetry, uh, and physics and mathematics in his head. And from that sort of solitude of this young guy came this spectacular idea, which is um, quantum physics, which uh, it's probably the greatest revolution or one of the greatest revolution in science ever. Um, it is something which slowly we are understanding, but very slowly. It's 100 years. Somebody is um, calling this the quantum century, and I think it's appropriate. It's really something more radical than Einstein's revolution about science, space time, which already is, is, is remarkably radical, uh, but it's something we um, uh, that hasn't been digested clearly, like after all, Einstein theory have been digested. Mm -hmm. And so let's get into this. I mean, you know, the, you know, for and for I'm sure almost everyone tuning in, like me, is not a not a physicist. So 
you know, you, you write so beautifully of, of, of Heisenberg on alone on Helgoland, the sort of desolate island. You, you write that he lifted a veil and an abyss opened. Why? What? What? What veil and and what abyss? What? Well, he himself didn't clearly know what, and and the conversation has been uh, has been on, going on from 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 for a century. So what has happened is the following: he was trying to figure out how the electron works in the atoms, how the atoms works, and the, the atom roughly is a it's an electron that go around the, go around the the nucleus. And, um, and, and, and the atom, uh, the electron did strange things like jumping from one orbit to the other. And everybody was trying to write equations or describe this behavior, how, how the electron moves. And it didn't work, it didn't work, it didn't work. It was, was a couple of decades that, that, that physicists uh, sort of became crazy of understanding how the atoms work. And this guy on the island has a single idea and find a mathematical way of, of, of describing it. And the single idea is that uh, um, the thing to do is not look for a new equation for the electron. So it's really radical. It's the kind of thing that uh, is a huge jumps in, uh, in, uh, in, in science, right? Like when, um, you know, for centuries, uh, people try to understand the sky uh, by finding the right combination of circles that give the motion of, the, of Venus, Mars, the sun, moon. Uh, and then, you know, Copernicus says, no, no, that's the wrong question. The question is not what is the right combination of circles uh, 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 that give the motion of the thing ar uh, around the Earth. Uh, the question, the point is that the Earth moves. So it's nothing to do with what we have been doing so far. And, and, and um, Heisenberg going to make a similar jump. It says, no, 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 the problem is not to find the force that drives the electron. The problem is that the electron is not what you thought it was. It's not a little stone moving around, it's not a particle. In fact, it's not a thing in the usual sense. And what Heisenberg does is, uh, uh, let's not describe, describe the electron, but let's describe only the way the electron affects me. And that suddenly works fantastically. So he writes the equation, not in terms of the position and the, um, and, 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 and velocity of the electron, but in terms of what we see from the outside, how the electron affects us. And this marvelous, it works fantastically well. And then quantum mechanics comes out from this calculus, uh, you know, nuclear power, quantum computing, entanglement, lasers, uh, um, medical applications, you name it. Uh, the, the modern technology is deeply based on that, but a huge problem is there. What does it mean that um, we describe things only in the way they affect something else? And uh, uh, you see, hundred years have passed, uh, and uh, I've I was recently looking at um, at the various reaction to quantum mechanics, and I found one uh, which is uh, so really good. Let me just read uh, one sentence to you. This is probably the greatest philosopher. Um, in the last 50 years, so according to some, is 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 is, is the greatest. Uh, uh, it's, it's one of his most quoted on the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. And he has a he has a metaphysical description of the world, and the, he does not cover quantum mechanics. And there's a text of him in the in the late 80s in which he says, uh, "I'm not ready to take lessons in ontology from quantum physics, so I'm not ready to take quantum physics seriously, uh, as I know it." Uh, first, I must see how it looks when it is purified from its frivolity, instrumental frivolity, um, double thinking deviant logic. Um, when it is purified of supernatural tales about the power of the observant mind to make things happening. So here is what he's saying. He's saying the way you physicists, you guys use quantum mechanics, it's like your mind is affecting reality. Okay? So you You're talking about how the electron affect your mind and your mind reality. And the philosopher is, he's right, he's completely right. He says, until you talk this way, you're talking nonsense. So let's, let's just take a second to, because essentially, you know, the whole book explores this kind of relational nature of things potentially. So 
you know, just to focus on Heisenberg and the um, and, and the, the, the these are sort of uh, quantum leaps of the of the kind of electrons. So, is, is uh, you... can, I, can I interrupt one second? Somebody put the question: Who is the philosopher? It's David Lewis. Sorry, apologies for not having said it. David Lewis. Great question, Zachary. And I should say, by the way, do do have some fire, fire across questions. Um, we'll we'll jump in and out, and I'll also leave lots of time after I stop abusing my prerogative as chair. Um, so please do post lots of questions. Um, thank you. So um, uh, could we just, um, especially for the non-physicists, this, this question, you, you, you write, why is it that we're not able to describe where the electron is or where the electrons are and what it's doing when we're not observing it? Why must we always uh, only speak only if it's observable? And the quote from the philosopher as well spoke of this central role of the observer. Just, just explain the, you know, the, the sort of strangeness of what, of what Heisenberg, the consequence of Heisenberg's alternative way of, of thinking about this, of sidestepping the, the, the way everyone else is thinking. About it. It's incredibly strange because in quant, in, in classical physics, in physics, in fact, in science, uh, we start from the idea that there are things out there, where there is an electron, where there is a pen. Well, is you and me, and these things have properties by themselves, not because there is something around. Yeah. Okay, and these properties can be described by science. Any other equation that tells you how this—I mean, more precise, less precise, depending on our understanding of our knowledge. Um, so there is a schema here. There is a structure. There are things which are properties, and the, the, the theory tells us how these properties evolve. And what Heisenberg does is to break this. Let's think the world in another way. So forget the atom have properties and I describe these properties. The electron is here and then it's here and then it's here and then it's here. Forget about that. You only describe how the atom affects you who are outside, what you see when you look at it. So you send a photon, wait a little bit, you see what comes out. We, after all, is what we do in the lab. In the lab, so it works very well in the laboratory. Or you know, if you want to build a computer, you need a microchip. You don't need to know what happened inside. You just need to know if I send some electricity here, what comes out the other side. So it works. It works very well. But correctly, anybody who is thinking, like the philosopher David Lewis, I, I mentioned, said, well, wait, "Wait a moment. Uh, you, you're only. Are you saying that reality becomes real only when you see it? That's nonsense." And quantum mechanics seems to be saying so. I don't think it does, but it seems to be saying so. And there's, a, there's an experiment you describe in the in the book of uh, a beam of photons being being split, which again sort of speaks to this strangeness of you know observing changing uh, or, 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 or uh, yeah the, the act yeah, of okay. observing affecting affecting effect yeah. Can you, is it possible to sort of explain, explain that, uh, that experiment uh, without? It's, a, it's a, I mean, going into details, it will probably take more than a, than a few minutes, but, uh, but I may say the, the, the sense of it. I talked in the book because uh, I actually saw it. I went in a laboratory uh, in Vienna uh, and, you know, it, it hadn't to be that, but it was the, the Anthony, Anthony the, uh, the laboratory of Anthony Zeilinger, one of the great experimentalists in, in quantum mechanics, uh, quantum, uh, um, uh, uh, quantum teletransportation. He's one of the uh, of the people who who started all this magic with quantum mechanics, and it's super simple. Um, you see, you, you have a photon which uh, can go two ways, okay? And you check. I mean, sometimes it goes this way, sometimes it goes this way, sometimes it goes this way, sometimes it goes way. It's never in both, okay? And then you 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 let it go without touching it. Okay, and uh, it uh, um, it always goes say down, but if you put a hand and you block one of the two paths, it might go up. So you say, wait a minute. Uh, if I block a hand, it has to go the other way, obviously, and I know that they always go down. So if I put a hand here, how can I tell the guy who is up that it should go the other way? I mean, it just doesn't work. I mean, this is fast, but if you, if you think carefully, just you say, it is impossible. And you go there, you put your hand, and that's exactly what happened, okay? Uh, so 
what is the point? The point is that uh, we make a mistake in thinking that there is an actual electron moving through this uh, photon, moving through this path or this path when we are not looking. There is a sense, uh, and, and this has to be understood, in which when we are not looking, it's I, it goes both ways. But if we look, we see it one way or the other way. And that's uh, a simple situation in which, you know, you have just, uh, uh, it's, it's like if you have a, a box with, uh, with two holes, okay? If you put one hole, the thing, something happened, if you put the other holes, um, the same thing happening, but if you don't look, something else happening. Mm. And you, you say, well, come on, either go here or go there. Uh, in both cases, something happened. And now, why, if I don't look, something different happened? So it's um, uh, the strangeness, it seems the observer plays a role. Uh, the core of my book, and let me just turn the page here, yeah. is uh, uh, one of the ideas to make sense of that, which is to say that the observer doesn't play any role. So the, the mind of us observing has nothing to do with that. Uh, we humans are not special in any sense. And, you know, David Lewis, the philosopher, is completely right. He's saying, I'm going to listen to your physicists only when they're giving me a more reasonable version of all that. And the point is that, and that's the, radi the, abs the absolute radicality of quantum theory coming out and shining, in my opinion. The point is that uh, we should not think that uh, objects have properties by themselves. Objects are proper, proper properties are relative to something else, which could be a human being, a mind, but also uh, another pen, a uh, notebook. This, when this touches this, this has a position with respect to the notebook. So we should think uh, properties don't characterize single object, characterize uh, two objects, one object having relation, having a property with respect to, one, to another. So there is a relational structure in the world. The world is a network of a property of a system relative to another system. And if you start thinking in this way, you don't need any special role to the mind, to the observer. You don't need any, any magic in the world, any magic connected to us. It's just nature, nature and things interacting with one another. Um, but it's not just objects with properties is object with relations between them. Mm -hmm. And this is, I believe, the deep message um, of quantum theory. And it forces us to rethink the ground, the grammar of, of the way in which we think uh, about reality. It, it thinks us to, to think relationally in terms of, in terms, rather than in terms of entities. So, so obviously this um, you know, this gets, get, gets deep, deep fast, but the, Another way of trying to respond, as you write in your book, um, another way of trying to explain uh, these photons acting in strange ways, according to the sort of observer, is the kind of multi-world um, sort of theory or hypothesis. You, you give that fairly short shrift in your book. I mean, not in an unreasonable, you know, but is it worth, you know, just, I think even for us non-physicists, it feels like the many worlds sort of interpretation, of, you know, has percolated into kind of culture and the popular imagination. Why do you think that's maybe not the right um, sort of sort of path or the, the right nature of, of, of reality as, as you as you believe it? Yeah, let me say what it is and why why I think uh, it, it might be less interesting. Um, uh, first of all, uh, it, it is another coherent way of trying to make sense of quantum theory. Yeah. It's not clear. It's not wrong. Um, uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's a following idea. Um, um, let's go back to the photon that can go to, to path, okay? And uh, um, let's say that if I'm not looking at it, the photon is really in both paths, okay? It's really here and also here, for real. Uh, so that's assumption. But then there's something to explain, which is, well, well, wait a moment. If I look at it, I always see either here or there. So the people who take 
this many world idea series is yeah, yeah. I mean, you see here or here because when you look, you split yourself in two. There is one you that sees it up and one see you that sees down. So now the world is here and there, and uh, uh, the photon is here and there, and you are doubled. So there's one universe, one world, in which the photon is up and you're, and you're seeing it up, and another in which is down and you're seeing it down. And this happens every time you interact with something. So it happens continuously. So the reality is that uh, you are not one. You are zillions and zillions and zillions of yourself each one of seeing a different reality. And the true reality is a combination of all this. This is co consistent, is coherent. The question is that uh, if we want to understand quantum theory, do we really have to go that way? Mm. Is that useful to go that way? I mean, after all, what we call real is what we want, right? We can call real what we want. But is it useful to call real a multiplicity of worlds of copies of ourselves. Um, it's like not, in my opinion, and let's say, I want to say why I, I, I like less this idea, because it, it's, it's saying our classical um, prejudices must be true. Things must be things. Um, if the photo can be there, then there should be a universe where it can be there. So it's imposing into reality, uh, forcing reality to follow our classical prejudices uh, at the cost of adding much more reality than what we see. We can do that, but I think it's more uh, intelligent and it's more fruitful on the long run to do the other thing, to say, no, no, wait, uh, it's our prejudices uh, that are wrong. We should change our conceptual structure and not believe that things have property by themselves. And then you don't need these other worlds. You don't need to give reality to copies of yourself. It's just one reality, one yourself, but properties are relational. You're, I'm such with respect to you, you're such with respect to something else. And this is this network of relation. Um, this, I think it's gonna be more useful as a way of interpreting quantum mechanics in the long run. And it, I mean, as I was reading Helga Land, you know, I was reminded of a, a quote from The Order of Time, one of your previous books, in which you write, the world is made up of kisses, not of stones, of sort of, of interactions and, and relations. I mean, again, for those of us, and, you know, everyone listening has got to buy this book and, and you know, meditate on it. But the, what, what, why, why is it such a, a sort of strange, um, why do you think it's so radical, the, the relational um, uh, view of things? And, and why do you think it's potentially more useful? I mean, there's a, an interesting exploration of entanglement and that phenomena using the kind of relational way of thinking. You know, why, why do you think it's so, so important that we, we really dwell on the relational um, you know, nature of things? Uh, it, it's a very good question. In fact, uh... I could say that um, for a physicist, uh, accepting this relational perspective of things is, is so ordinarily radical. But it's less radical. If you look, if I look at it in a in a wider perspective, it's far less radical than what it looks for a scientist like me. <laughs> because we think relationally in so many aspects of life already. So we used to think in terms of relations, right? We, so, so many uh, properties of, of, when we think in terms of uh, econom economics, psychology, sociology, biology, um, we think how things interact. And we give name of properties of things depending on the way they interact with something else. Uh, your brother, because you have a brother, is not, not brother by yourself. It's your brother by virtue of being another thing, which is your brother. Uh, so it's a relational property, not the, not the, not the property just by yourself, and so on. Uh, so we think of the world in terms of relations, uh, but we we wish to anchor these relations on some underground fixed reality 
where there's just a substance with properties. And uh, uh, in a sense, physics, which is the, the, the preferred place where to find this ground, is telling us, no, no, forget about it. <laughs> it's relations all the way down. Um, and so this is an invitation for the rest of culture, I think. And uh, what, I, what I find interesting, as you, as you said in opening, is not what each science has to say by itself, but the dialogue and the exchange of ideas that uh, work between different sectors of our culture. Um, and, and what physics is, uh, modern physics, contemporary physics, last, cent last century physics, uh, sort of telling us is if, if we go in the direction of relational thinking rather than think in terms of, um, um, of entities, uh, that works better for nature. Nature is more about relations than, uh, um, than about entities with properties. Uh, um, and I think this has a, it, it, it meaningful in philosophy, it's meaningful in politics, it's meaningful in psychology. It just uh, avoids us to go to the wrong direction. I mean, mm. if, if I want to understand my psychology, you shouldn't understand me. You should understand how I interact with, uh, with, with the outside. This is a simple example, um, but uh, it, it, it goes all over, in my opinion. The, um, I've got to say, I mean, Carlo's books are always so beautiful, you know, the, the, the language. And this book, I think, tonally kind of feels perhaps different to the, the previous three I've read, in that it's, in a sense, less, it's just as beautiful and just as poetic, but in a less sort of joyful, there's a sort of troubling you know, almost a kind of sense of trepidation about this, or the abyss, the, or the, the, you know, how strange and, and radical this is. Is that, is that your feeling uh, about this as you, as you peer into this relational, you know, sense of reality? You have a, you have a line somewhere, um, which is that, uh, you know, reality has, has broken up into uh, a play of mirrors. Um, you know, this, is, is, that, is that how you feel? What's your, what's your, what's your emotional state? You... You, you definitely captured something, something very true about these books. Uh, I think that my books are different from one another and they're also different because uh, uh, they have different emotional tone, so to say. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the Seven Lessons was definitely joyful. I mean, look, this is beautiful. <laughs> Look how beautiful is modern physics telling us, wow, it's just, you know, curving space and exploding black holes. So, um, the order of time was a bit different because uh, uh, it also was uh, confident in telling about the, all the mysteries of time. And the, um, but to think about time is to think about death and to think about our own relation, uh, sort of uh, experimental relation with time. So there was, there was a side of it which was uh, the, the unavoidable nostalgic feeling of the passing of time. Uh, so there was Horace the poet and, uh, and, 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 and confronting what it means, the, the finiteness of our time. But again, this was nothing really troubling intellectually in a mm -hmm. sense. I mean, the things we don't know about time, the open mysteries, but you know, it's, this book was different because I struggled much more to write this book than the others. Mm -hmm. In a sense, the others, I was saying, look, I know this, I'm telling you this, okay? Or I view this, uh, this time, so right at the beginning, I say, well, I'm telling you how to understand quantum mechanics or perhaps even why we don't understand quantum mechanics. So there is a hesitation which is all over the book, which is intellectual. Uh, there is, a, as I said, I, I'm, I'm offering a perspective in, on quantum mechanics on which I've worked a lot, other people worked a lot, but I know that there are other possibilities of confronting quantum mechanics. You mentioned the many world. So uh, there's something extraordinarily deep that the new physics is telling us about reality, but it's not that I'm totally sure about. Uh, I, I'm, I'll tell you where we are. And, yeah. and, and the way I think about this. And this comes through the book. Uh, comes through the book all over because there is a, uh, an uncertainty, not just the, the sheer joy of, <laughs> of, uh, of talking about the, the marvels of the world. Um, still, I find that the, this deeply relational take 
on uh, on reality um, talks to a sort of ethical side of our relation with reality itself because uh, it means dissolving things. And one of the key things we deal with is our self. So to the extent in which we have a view of reality in which we ourselves are not things, but are relations with the rest, uh, I do find, I, I, I could never separate uh, physics from philosophy from our actual uh, attitude, stance toward, toward life. Because when we believe something, it has immediately affects what we are. We cannot separate things. Um, so I find that, uh, so in, in part of the book, I do connect uh, uh, this relational perspective on reality uh, with the way, with, with the sort of the indication that give us about how to look about ourselves. Um, and I find this not troubling the other way around. I, I find that uh, it's a message of uh, take it easy. Yeah. Well, look, I'm going to um, open out to questions from the audience very soon. Um, so please do keep posting your questions. They're hugely appreciated. We'll, we'll hammer through lots of them. But, you know, your, your, your books, Carlo, it was always a sort of very beautiful um, conversation within your books um, between uh, you know, physics and, and culture, literature, poetry, philosophy and stuff. One of the things that sort of I find fascinating about quantum physics is, how, in a sense, how little it's troubled um, sort of wider, wider culture. Um, you know, there's Michael Frayn's play Copenhagen, which is one of my favorite plays, but, you know, there's, you know, strange things like entanglement and so on. You don't really see it popping up too much in even, you know, sci-fi movies, let alone, let alone sort of dripping into art and culture. Yeah. Do you think that is 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 something that we'll we'll start to see? Do you think maybe the relational way of thinking perhaps is a more sort of philosophically sort of accessible and and but but sometimes a radical way for artists, writers, you know, to and, and you know to, to start to engage with with this world of, of of quantum physics and and you know is that is that something you you know you'd like to like to see? Yes, um, the answer is yes to everything you said. Namely, first of all, uh, I've been surprised uh, uh, since I was young uh, and since I studied quantum physics at university. Uh, also, being being not a nerd concentrated in physics only, but being by by character, by personality, sort of looking around, uh, I, I I was studying quantum physics and say, well, wait a minute, what, why why everybody isn't reacting to that? I mean, it's like you know. Um, if I was in the Renaissance and discovered that the Earth is moving, I say, guys, the Earth is moving. We're not sitting on a, we're not the center of the universe. This means something that we're not the center of the universe. So it's a similar. Um, the reason this has happened, I think, is not because of uh, the culture wants to be uh, death, because uh, the early discussion of quantum mechanics. I mean, if you read uh, the Man Without Quality model, there, there is there are discussions about quantum mechanics there about Bohr ideas. Um, Musil was engaged, was trying to figure out what, what the hell is going on there. But then quantum mechanics became so strange, so radical, that I think um, the reaction of the philosopher I mentioned it was quintessential. It was like, come on, it's, it's too strange for take it seriously. I mean, either you, you go in a sort of idealistic, there's only the mind, uh, but that's wrong. <laughs> um, so there were a few reactions. Uh, you mentioned Copenhagen, the, the, the play, which is a marvelous place, absolutely beautiful place, which um, tells the same story from different three times from different perspectives uh, and, uh, and goes exactly to this dissolution of a unique reality in, in, in a game of perspectives in which there is no single truth, there are different perspectives on, 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 on the thing. Um, I think that with the recent revival of discussions about quantum mechanics that has been happening in physics and philosophy departments, slowly um, the world of culture at large, uh, it's gonna react to that, including the arts. I mean, I, I get a lot of artists that contact me and say, look, I read what you're writing, I read what other people are writing, this talks to me. I wanna express this in some way. And it doesn't have to be, an understanding, it has, it has a, you know, 
like when Milton talks about moving um, a, 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 in Paradise Lost, uh, flying in the uh, among the stars, uh, you know, there is the the sense of Newton and Copernicus behind. Everything has changed. The world the worldview has changed. I expect this slowly to happen. This is a quantum century. So um, we have to accept, learn slowly that not only we're not the center of the universe, but also the idea of matter that we have is different. Like we learned that time is not what we thought it is. Um, things are not what we thought they are. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it, there's, there's so many, so many um, sort of beautiful, beautiful lines uh, in the in the book. But uh, you know, you write uh, the interconnectedness of things, the reflection of one and another shines with a clear light that the coldness of 18th century mechanics could not capture. I mean, to me that, you know, is so inspiring, you know, creatively, let alone, you know, for, for those of you who are physicists, you know. Um, but, but, you know, it is interesting to me, a hundred years after, you know, Bohr and Heisenberg, it, it is still, it's taken such a long time to sort of percolate through, but maybe that is a sign of its fundamental strangeness it's so at odds with our everyday sense of things it's it hard. took 150 years to the copernican revolution to be uh, to be accepted and absorbed a century and a half um and thank you for quoting that uh passage about uh, uh, the coldness of um of sort of uh, mechanicist or uh, mechanism philosophy and uh, 18th century understanding of uh, of reality because that's a, that that's a point I think that's a key point. Uh, um, science has at some point has told the rest of the culture uh, that there is a simple mind version of materialism in which the world is just little bit little stone bouncing around. Uh, it's only true in an approximation. If you if if you listen to science and you look things better, reality is more complex than that. Mm. Not because there are magic spiritual things affecting things. I'm, I'm not. I, I'm, uh, I'm 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 a naturalist. I'm a materialist in a, in a larger sense. But reality is not just little stones bouncing around. And there is space in the physical reality for much more complexity than. Uh, what instinctively come out from the cold, uh, icy world of classical physics, so to say. Quantum physics is richer. It allows, when, and in fact, the, the last part of my book, uh, I, I try to indicate uh, uh, domains where I think that uh, we are misled by thinking that the world is like in classical physics, including when we think about consciousness or we think about things like that. Yeah. Well, look, it's it's beautiful. I cannot recommend this this book enough, and I'm sure uh, I'm sure we're all going to pick up a copy. So, listen, I'd love to um, open up to to questions. So, please do keep please do keep um, posting uh, questions. We've had lots of lots of fantastic um, um, you know questions posted. Um, I'm going to start with um, Alex Morrison. Um, you know, so there's lots of questions in 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 different in different areas. Um, uh, actually, sorry, yeah, uh, who who asks about entanglement? And this might be, you know, this is a real test of Carlo's incredible ability to 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 <laughs> explain and describe hugely complex ideas. And but um, uh, Alex um, writes, could you speak about entanglement and the the role of the the observer? In, in this you know, incredibly strange um, you know, aspect of quantum, quantum physics. No, I'm gonna fail the test uh, that you <laughs> that you gave me entirely. To the point, uh, entanglement is beautiful. It's at the core of, uh, of quantum mechanics. And in the book, I have a, a full chapter, which I focus on entanglement, trying to say exactly what it is, because it's confusing what it is, and how uh, a relational perspective uh, uh, can give a way of thinking about that. Um, but it's not easy to the point that at some point I decided to write the book without this chapter. I took it away. And then I, I said, no, wait a moment. I, I cannot talk about quantum mechanics and not talk about the entanglement because it's too, it's too, it's too central. So I put it back, but, uh, but it required a full, a full. So, Condensing it in a in a one line answer is not going to make justice to it, but I'll try. Um, 
Entanglement is a very strange, um, uh, it's, it's a phenomenon that we can check in the laboratory. I mean, there are, it's, it's, it's very real. I mean, there are papers say, look, I've measured the entanglement. And it's a, it seems like uh, you can take two objects and separate them, and they remain in a strange connection to one another. So if, if something happened to one, uh, uh, the other one is like if it knows it, OK? Uh, immediately, instantaneously. So it, like it send a message super rapidly, but we don't think that it send a message super rapidly. Not only that, we cannot use it to send messages. So something else should happen. And the, this is very mysterious. When you look at it, you say, come on, this is impossible. But what the relational quantum mechanics, the, the relational perspective of that, um, careful, is that if you are here, nothing is happening there. And if you're here, nothing is happening there. So the happening of something is relation, relative. So if you're somewhere and you see something, you measure something, you measure a property, that's real for you, but it's not real for the other. When you compare the two, it's only later on when you, 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 have, you actually have sent a message from one to the other. So if you take relationalism seriously, you don't need to think that there are sort of super fast traveling information. There's a beautiful section. The, the section in this book on time is, 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 is beautiful. And the, there's a description of a looking at a butterfly that I won't, you have to buy the book. It, it, just for that, it's worth the, the admission price. But uh, yeah, it, it's uh, you know, incredibly, incredibly interesting, troubling, interesting stuff. Um, great question from um, Nick, and forgive me if I mispronounce your surname, Nick, um, Gatsigis, um, who's, who asks, is the radical way of, uh, is the radical, new radical way of thinking about the universe and reality as a network of relationships, is that affecting the way we should think about politics, social issues, and even personal relationships? Right, Nick. Um, yes, uh, or at least uh, uh, it, it might, it definitely might. Uh, not because, uh, I mean, you know, politics is funny. If you believe something, you believe it, whatever, whatever science tells you. <laughs> um, but it pushed, so it's not that necessarily, if you think about quantum mechanics, uh, uh, you think politics more in terms of relations, but it definitely pushes you toward uh, realizing that um, uh, Relational thinking works better even in politics, which means very simply in, 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 my, in my reading of it. And again, I don't want to make a, a necessary uh, connection, but it's a very easy connection to do um, that uh, we, we flourish because we are in relations. Uh, groups flourish because they interact with one another. Countries flourish because they interact with one another. Uh, so let me put it very, very simply. Uh, Einstein said that nationalism is, 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 is a disease that uh, it's, uh, it's creating trouble for everybody. Mm. The... Because it feels to see that uh, if you isolate something uh, to make it stronger, uh, you're actually destroying its, uh, its, its possibility of existing by, 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 by decreasing the, con the, the necessary connections. We, we, we leave of interaction, we don't leave of, 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 of great interactions. Mm. Really, I, mean, I think there's so many fascinating philosophical consequences. Question from Prasanna. Um, uh, and it's a bit of a long question, but I'm just going to read it um, from, from start to finish, but it's a great question. She writes, uh, or Prasanna writes, I understand that our universe might be a relational one, as you describe in Helgoland, but do you believe there is a truly objective reality under all of it when we, uh, and if we remove humans stroke consciousness from the universe that we can understand? Or, writes Prasanna, do you think there is an objective reality but we can never see or understand it because in order to see it, we need to not exist or have consciousness. So yeah, is there a, is there, and she writes, in essence, are we unable to see true, real, true reality because we exist? Okay, so first of all, um, this relation is, has nothing to do with the human we. There's no we here. So 
uh, w when I talk about relation, I think this is a key point, is the, the key steps that was hard to digest for the fathers of, of quantum theory. Relationalism, or, or more called contextualism, uh, contextuality, is not the things that are in relation to my mind, to my consciousness, to somebody seeing it. Uh, they're just in relation to something else. So if you take away humans, uh, nature is exactly the same as before. Nothing changes in nature. Humans play no role in nature. Nature continues by itself, okay? Now the question is uh, uh, all right, but each single object uh, um, uh, has property with respect to things outside. So does something has property with respect to nothing? No. Does this mean that uh, behind this relative manifestation, there is a reality, uh, a sort of underlying reality beyond the, the, the relative manifestations, I, I would say, what sort of question is that? Uh, why do we need to ask something like that? Um, for us, reality is, is, for me, reality is that tree, this computer, my blob. It's an ensemble of things that manifest themselves. So it's an empty question to ask the, if there is a reality beyond what we see. Uh, there's plenty of stuff beyond what I see, because there's what you see. And there's a plenty of stuff beyond what I see and you see, because I'm sure that in Andromeda, there are things affecting one another, uh, it, it, nothing to do with you and I. But beyond all these manifestations, is there a final reality? I think that we learn, and I, I, I quote this Buddhist philosopher, I, and I have a chapter on him in the book, Nagarjuna, who makes it so clearly, in my opinion, um, it's a mistake to try to look at something grounding uh, an objectivity beyond uh, the, 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 the large coherence between all the relative manifestations of things with respect to one another. Mm. There's lots of, uh, lots of questions coalescing um, around, around uh, the question of quantum physics and, and, and consciousness. So I'm gonna just pick one of those questions, but thank you for everyone hosting. Ronnie Fraser. Uh, who writes, could you say a few words, uh, please, Carlo, about the insights quantum mechanics can offer on consciousness studies and, and also mental well-being? But I guess all this, this is about sort of how the mind works. And, uh, and you do discuss the mind-body duality, actually, in the book, which we haven't even, <laughs> haven't even got into here. Yes, I have a chapter. The final chapter is uh, it's, uh, it's what quantum physics can tell us uh, regarding the problem of the uh, uh, mind-body duality. And uh, uh, my answer is uh, uh, nothing at all and a lot. Uh, so, uh, l l but, but in a clear sense, not in a, not in a vague sense. Nothing at all in the sense that uh, uh, the mind-body problem, mind problem is a problem um, of understanding um, the complexity of biology, the complexity of uh, uh, neuroscience. So I think if you want to understand what is a mind, uh, you have to read uh, uh, Damasio, you have to read uh, the neuroscientist, uh, you have to read uh, um, those who study the brain. Okay. Uh, if uh, So in a sense, I don't think there is nothing specifically quantum mechanic um, in the working of the brain. Uh, those who try to say there is something specific quantum mechanics, I think that they're, they're tempting, they're trying, but I don't see anything convincing. So that's a no part. But then there's a yes part. And the yes part is the following. Um, it seems that what is mental is completely different than what is physical. And it seems that the bridge between physics and the mental is such a huge gap that how can we fill it? But this is because we think physics in terms of uh, 19th century physics, uh, stones bouncing around. I if you take the lesson of quantum mechanics seriously, physics is richer than that. Physics is about things manifest to one another. Not necessarily, necessarily mind. I mean, how a stone affects another stone, how a star hits another planet. So if you think that that's what physics is, physics is how things affect one another, then from there, it's much less hard to, it's, it's much easier to believe that, all right, so we have a brain, we have a body, very complicated homeostasis, more uh, com complicated stuff, reaction to the outside continues. Our mind is just the name we give to the phenomena that in our body um, happen 
And these phenomena are a manifestation of part of a body to, to itself and, 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 and outside to, 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 to the body and, and to the mind and to the brain. So it gives a, uh, an underlying philosophical uh, structure uh, which, in which the, the mind-body problem becomes much less uh, uh, strange. But of course, this is not a solution. Then, then we have to make the work of understanding what, what is brain actually doing and what is a cell doing and what is, a, um, what is an organ is doing. And I think if we do these steps, and a lot of these steps have been filled out, not all, then the mind problem, uh, mind body problem disappears. I think mind is just as a working of the, of the body. Um, yeah, fantastic discussion of that in Helgoland. Um, not yet another reason to, to buy a copy of, the, of this fantastic work. Last question, we're, we're almost out of time. I really honestly could bend Carlo's ears for uh, 10 hours, but I mainly have one. So um, a fantastic question from, uh, uh, Again, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing, but Julia Torino, who, who writes, thanks and congratulations for this exciting new book, Carlo. Um, how do you think the quantum century and its relational nature could, should, uh, Julia writes, inform the relation between humans and non-humans, nature, animals, uh, uh, but also AI, Julia writes, in the 21st century? A great question about the sort of implications of of, of the relation, the deep philosophical and uh, political perhaps implications of relational thinking? Um, my sense is that uh, uh, quantum mechanics uh, uh, has been one chapter of many in the development of uh, our scientific understanding of the world, uh, uh, which is indicating more and more that uh, the difference between uh, um, humans and everything which is human, including culture um, and, and everything we do as humans and the rest of nature is much less than what we thought. So uh, we as organism and we as a culture, we as language are just you know, one of the various phenomena of, of, of nature, um, a nice one for us, one that for us has a lot of value, of course, because value depend, depend on us, comes from us. Uh, but it's just one of the one of the things happening in, in, in a network of relations. Um, and obviously uh, with a, with a, with a, uh, with ecological crisis in which I guess we are, we are going, this has strong uh, repercussion on, 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 on political decision and what we should do because uh, uh, if, to the extent in which we realize that you know we're just a, a, a little piece of a, of, of a mechanism much larger that is working because it works together, uh, we that have these additional tools of uh, rationality, which is a recent development in, in, in evolution, and, and, and can work out our own uh, biological priorities, uh, but by using our developed rationality, uh, we, we can use this knowledge for better uh, you know, uh, realizing our aims. Our aim is surviving, for instance. Um, uh, but in order to do that, uh, and I think the, the question sent to the point, uh, it's crucial that we recognize that uh, we're just part of nature and we are part of the, uh, of, 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 of the rest. And uh, the more we decrease uh, uh, sort of intellectually, deeply, this idea that there is a separation, nature, culture, um, mind, body, uh, humans, non-humans. Uh, you know, this is uh, just uh, another version like uh, uh, we Italians are better and everybody else is bad. I mean, it's the same story. Yeah, amen to that. Um, Carlo, Carlo writes, you know, towards the conclusion of the book, I think it's time for this theory, you know, relational theory, to, uh, to take this theory fully on board, for its nature to be discussed beyond the restricted circles of theor theoretical physicists and philosophers, to deposit its distilled honey, sweet and intoxicating, into the whole of contemporary culture, which you know is such a beautiful sentiment and ambition. And, and you know, the, the the I think I think you're going to succeed. I think this book, Helgoland Carlo, is going to be. We're going to look back and say this is where that conversation began. That that uh, you know, and I think it's you know I can't wait to see where that. Um, how that unfolds, that sort of, uh, and, and cascades. It's going to be a beautiful thing. 
Thank you so much, everyone, for, for tuning in. I'm very depressed that we're now at the end of this, this conversation. But I would, I would say, you know, Helga Land is available from Second Homes Bookshop Liberia, from our online shop, uh, from places like bookshop.org, uh, and, and anywhere you can buy great books. But, you know, I want to say a huge thank you to all of you for tuning in, uh, to the good people at, uh, at Penguin Random House, particularly Annabelle Huxley, but especially to Carlo Ravelli for, you know, letting us, you know, explore with him and meditate with him. This incredibly beautiful, troubling, um, inspiring, um, you know, view of view of reality. So thank you so much, Carly. We, Carla, we really, really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. And buy, do buy this book. Um, the the uh, the podcast audio recording will be released in the next couple of days. We'll be uploading uh, a, a YouTube version of this too. Uh, so do feel free to kind of pa pass it on, um, you know, spread the word and, uh, you know, let's get more people, you know, discussing this, you know, beautiful, uh, beautiful theory. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ciao. Ciao for now.